apologize in advance for the color scheme on my PowerPoint, but what's done is done. <laughs> okay, so um, post-colonialism is uh, one of the trendiest frameworks on uh, Australian university campuses today. The basic sentiment, um, which comes up in a variety of disciplines, but most often uh, history and English and gender studies, is that the core of world politics is a conflict between the West and the global South. Like its uh, close cousin postmodernism, postcolonialism is uh, intellectually concerned with combating Marxism, both in arguing the theory needs to be updated and in, in occasionally um, or often condemning it in total. So I'll argue today that post-colonialism falls short on many counts. It fails to explain why colonialism emerged and it fails to explain what drives imperialism today. It importantly fails to grasp that the key antagonism of global capitalism that uh, is that class exists in every single country, you know, east, east or west, north or south. And for those of us wanting to change the world, post-colonialism offers no path um, for solidarity and no, uh, no path for um, struggle, actually. It often renounces from the outset that international solidarity is even possible. So to understand and change the world then, post-colonialism is no match for Marxism. So um, to avoid the charge of having cherry-picked inaccurate targets, because post-colonialism is a um, quite an amorphous discipline at times, I'm going to base my critique primarily on Edward Said and um, thinkers from the Subaltern Studies Collective, and that's the, um, the front page of an edition of their journal. Um, these uh, thinkers are seen as the spokespeople and standard bearers of post-colonialism and have certainly been the most influential in establishing some of the concepts that are varyingly applied. So um, I'll start off by tracing the historical development of post-colonialism. So um, Edward Said's Orientalism and the Subaltern Studies Collective formed um, around the same time in the late 1970s. And this was at the tail end of a period of radical hope. And initially the theorists had been influenced by that radical hope. Said, uh, as a Palestinian supported the resistance to Israeli occupation and the Indian theorists uh, were distinctly uh, influenced by E.P. Thompson's Marxist history from below. And some had flirted with Maoism, which is kind of the, the sort of headiness of this period is expressed in the quote that you are seeing on your screen now. But this radical hope died in the 1980s. Neoliberalism was on the rise in America. The struggle of the anti-Vietnam War and civil rights period was well and truly over. In India, a series of radical movements had failed to challenge the Indian National Congress, which was, uh, which is the major bourgeois party in India, and uh, many sellouts by a variety of communist parties were uh, breeding disaffection with Marxism in intellectual circles. So this, you know, political environment had a massive impact on universities, uh, mainly because a demoralization set in. So political battlegrounds intellectually were shifting from destroying capitalism or talking about total structural transformation to challenging language, uh, discourse, culture and representation. Essentially, horizons were narrowing and importantly, there was a distinct sense that academics wanted to move on with their lives and their careers and leave the old talk of revolution behind. So post-colonialism then was born in the context of an academic giving up of fighting for liberation. It was born not in struggle, but in defeat, not in collaboration with social movements, but on university campuses in retreat from real politics. And I think today post-colonialism should really be seen as part and parcel of the postmodernism and identity politics that dominates university campuses today. And it shares many of the same downfalls. So I think that brief history is important for uh, explaining why certain elements of post-colonialism are emphasized. Now the core argument of post-colonial theory is that all people and all forms of politics history, literature and communication developing out of Europe are inherently complicit in racism and imperialism and therefore incapable of explaining life in the colonised or post-colonial world. Uh, and often this emerges as a sentiment rather than a clearly stated theory. 
but it's the major argument of Said's Orientalism. And the, the culprits, the target of, of, um, uh, of post-colonial theory goes by many names. Sometimes it's Europeans, sometimes it's the West, um, but today the most uh, trendy categories are white people and colonizers. Now, Said's criticism in Orientalism, bits of it are just self-evidently true and right. Um, it's obviously true that much history and literature produced in the West contains racist assumptions about the third world. So Said uh, lampoons the widely employed caricature that people in the East are simple and mystical and overly religious and violent, uh, whereas the West is advanced and scientific and liberal. It's true that this dialogue in the colonial period was employed not just by bourgeois governments, but by um, a series of liberals who gave support to imperialism by painting conquests as, um, as for the greater good and for societal advancement. And this is, it's no less true today. So just think of the um, way the, you know, the bourgeois and liberal press were unified in chorus um, justifying the invasion of Afghanistan, both 20 years ago and today. That's a true criticism, but the issue is that Said doesn't limit his um, criticisms to colonial governments and their liberal apologists. He considers that everything and everyone in Europe, um, even the political left, is complicit in imperialism, and I think this is just deeply mistaken. So firstly, uh, it's an incorrect starting point to talk about Europe as an undifferentiated block. The core of European capitalism, as in every single country, is class division. There exists a ruling capitalist class with control over production and a majority working class who are exploited and denied all decision-making ability. So this means simply that when we talk about the culprits of colonialism, it's not Europeans in general, but specifically the merchants, the traders, the politicians, and the aristocracy who funded, justified, armed, and carried out colonial invasions. So there was no vote on whether England or Spain should set up colonies. Um, there was no vote on whether peoples should be pillaged. And actually, during the first centuries of colonialism, the majority of European peasants would have been almost entirely unaware that the expeditions were taking place at all. Now, post-colonialists um, may argue that there is, there is a Europe-wide complicity in imperialism by claiming that Western workers benefit from a generally raised standard of living financed in part by profits accrued from the colonial project. But this just misunderstands how capitalism works because European profits are produced in large part by European workers. The colonial spoils were accrued and pocketed not by the European majority, but by the aforementioned elite. And while it is undoubtedly true that many Western workers have a greater general standard of living than the extreme poverty experienced by many in the third world, this is not, was not achieved at the expense of third world workers. Um, and it was not achieved through any alliance with colonial governments. Indeed, whatever rights Western workers have was snatched through struggle against their own ruling class. And the ruling classes responsible for colonial atrocities were and are responsible for the exploitation of workers and peasants in their home nations as well. So the British government, for example, in its 19th century colonial heyday, massacred protesters demanding democratic rights at Peterloo in 1812. There's other examples, but this is possibly the most famous. And to whatever extent Western workers do support their own government or support, you know, supported colonial expeditions or support imperialism today, that's a problem. Um, it's been a long-standing assertion of Marxists that it's it's self-injurious for workers to adopt nationalism because that involves allying with the oppressor rather than recognizing and fighting exploitation. But these things are, they're just political attitudes. They can be um, fought and changed. Um, they're, not, um, they're not fixed and eternal. Now, secondly, um, post-colonialists argue that European leftists um, in general, and in particular Marxists, reproduce imperialist assumptions. One version of this argument is that Marxism is Eurocentric for centering a political theory on capitalism because capitalism developed in Europe. Now, it is 
just the case that capitalism emerged as a fully fledged social system in Europe um, and then spread across the world through in large part the colonial process. This is not racist ideology, it's just historical fact and recognising that reality does not mean supporting it. But capitalism did not emerge out of anything innate in European culture. Um, there has been just scores of literature in the Marxist tradition explaining why capitalism first emerged in Europe, and none of it repeats enlightenment crap about Europeans being advanced and liberal. Um, rather, there are a variety of complex and often slow developing economic and political factors leading up to the emergence of capitalism in the West. And the reason that capitalism did not um, sort of organically develop in the East is, uh, again, not due to any cu cultural factors. There's significant debate about what precisely took place. Uh, but one theory holds that it was actually the relative dynamism of and productivity of feudal economies in the Middle East and the self-consciousness of for example, the Chinese state bureaucracy compared to their European counterparts, which stymied the development of large scale industry and a new capitalist class. But capitalism now exists in every corner of the globe. It does not make sense to talk about capitalism as being a European system when the capitalist class comprises all varieties of colours and nationalities. And the majority of working class people in the world today reside outside Europe. And centering a political analysis on capitalism is also the only way to understand the history of colonialism or understand imperialism today, because these are processes that emerged out of competition and the drive for capital to expand. And now, um, finally, or thirdly, post-colonialists um, sometimes argue that Marx supported colonialism. Um, because of his arguments that capitalism was in part a progressive social system. Um, but I think this is just a caricature of his arguments and intellectually lazy in my opinion, because Marx condemned the slave trade and colonialism. And indeed he condemned um, the uprooting of peasants from their land, which was necessary for the establishment of capitalism in Europe. Um, he argued that the most important contradiction of capitalism is that this system has created a global working class with the ability to destroy capitalism. So I think it's just absurd to say that Marx um, supported capitalism and colonialism when he agitated his entire life for the system to be overthrown. Um, and probably, arguably, his greatest legacy is succeeding at spreading those revolutionary activist ideas internationally. But I think lastly, I think probably the most common, um, but also the most banal post-colonial critique of Marxism today is that he himself as an individual was a European or an old white man. So yes, the sky is blue, you know, Marx was European. Um, they were men, um, but Marx and Engels were also the most thoroughgoing opponents of European imperialism active in their lifetimes. There were other progressives who criticized elements of the colonial project, um, but there were none who took it so far as Marx and Engels by supporting every anti-colonial uprising, whether of the Irish or of Indians. Now, some critics pick out snippets of letters from Marx and Engels, which employed language that's not in keeping with modern anti-racist standards. But I just think this ignores the historical context of Marx and Engels holding far and away the most progressive political opinions of the time. You just cannot expect people 150 years ago to have identical cultural norms to us today. That, that's an impossible metric to set up. But yeah, I think that I just think it's churlish, um, unscientific moralism to say that quotes like the one people are seeing on your screen are the same as supporting colonialism. It's insane. Okay, so to sum up that section, it's wrong to treat the West as an undifferentiated unit, but I think it's equally mistaken to treat the East as undifferentiated and to treat the post-colonial bourgeoisie as victims of racism. Now, I thought I'd share a quote from um, an assigned reading uh, from an international relations course that I have to take um, to demonstrate how this is applied. So it says, according to neorealists, there exists a balance of power between and among great powers. Most of these great powers are not incidentally white majority states, 
and they sit atop the hierarchy with small and notably less white powers organized below them. Now, given the most important imperial tension in the world today is between the United States and China, um, and the site of imperial conflict, I would argue, we might contest this, um, most likely to spill over into actual war is between Israel and Iran. I think it is just, it's like, shit to see imperialism today as driven by whiteness. It's crazy. Um, it's not the case that great power relations encompass white states oppressing non-white states. By painting colonialism and imperialism as a battle between East and West, Black and white, post-colonialists actually write out uh, class differences in the global South. And in so doing, I think post-colonialism is rendered completely incapable of explaining modern day imperialism and becomes totally uncritical of a big chunk on a big chunk of the global ruling class. Because in actually in many parts of the world today, being anti-European is not a radical political position to take at all. Um, actually in some parts of the world, it is a downright backwards and reactionary one. So in, well, probably China is the best example of this. Like in China today, anti-Western propaganda is totally geared towards binding the population in nationalism to gear up for a potential war with the United States. Um, so, you know, socialists in China should oppose that rhetoric as much as we oppose, um, you know, the US alliance in Australia. Now, in India today, um, it is a standard uh, talking point for the Indian uh, the ruling um, Indian People's Party to denounce Western science, Western medicine and Western democracy as foreign to the nation. This dialogue helps to build the strength of fascists in the Hindu nationalist movement who seek to recapture what they see as the organic and essential Indian nation um, by in part expunging foreigners, mostly Muslims, but also Christians and Jews. And again, this dialogue, it serves even when it's not employed by, by fascists, um, it serves a nationalist purpose. India today is home to the third most billionaires on earth. The Indian capitalist class uh, determines the wages of Indian workers. That's a um, that photo there. It's um, that's the yeah home of the richest person in India um, in a city that is home to 40 million people who live in, in slums. So it's just disgraceful, isn't it? Um, but yeah, the Indian capitalist class determines the wages of Indian workers. Um, the Indian capitalist class invests in development that demolish slums for luxury apartments. They oversee a brutal occupation in Kashmir and command a nuclear arsenal. Um, this year, the Indian political class chose to essentially unleash coronavirus with now millions dead. So in this context, opposing the West is just completely missing the point. Indian workers and the poor need to direct their fire towards their own ruling class, and they need to overthrow that scum to be liberated. So most people in the global South are actually not being oppressed by the West, but failing to recognize class differences in all states and placing blame wholly on the West is deeply mistaken even in oppressed nations. And I think the clearest example of this is Palestine. So Israel is backed not only by the United States, but by a variety of scum Arab governments like Egypt. But within Palestine itself, there is a meager capitalist class who have effectively agreed to act as a police force against Palestinian resistance in the West Bank in return for the tiniest snatches of land granted by Israel. So the capitalist class everywhere makes agreements with each other that involve stepping on workers, even in conditions of imperialism. And so that's why it was a good and important development when protesters in the West Bank in June chanted that Abbas, head of the Palestinian Authority, must resign. And this, this is not a new thing, um, like class difference in, the, in oppressed nations and the global south is not a new thing. In the colonial period, when uh, colonial states encountered um, classless societies like in Australia and North America, their approach was largely genocidal. They attempted to wipe out societies based on cooperative production that was so alien to the capitalist model. But where the colonial states encountered class societies, as in most of the global South, their first approach was to make deals with the existing ruling class. It would have been impossible for the British East India Company to gain a foothold in India 
um, had various arms of the domestic ruling class not agreed to in some way work together. If representatives of the Mughal Empire had not approved licenses, if merchants had refused to trade, if landlords and tax collectors had refused to give the British a cut. These political and economic agreements were made because they were mutually advantageous. The uh, British colonial expansion um, in India occurred in a period of crisis and decline for the Mughal Empire. But even the anti-colonial national liberation movements of the 20th century did not wipe out class differentiation. Radical nationalists um, such as Gandhi and the Indian National Congress or the National Liberation Front in Algeria or many others came to oppose colonization, but they did not oppose capitalism. They actually just wanted to rule this, this system more luxuriously. So Marxists like Lenin, Trotsky and the Indian communist MN Roy argued urgently that although workers and bosses came together under the same flag in national liberation movements, the oppressed could not be liberated if the economy remained unchanged, if there still remained class oppression, now with the oppressed minority bearing the same skin colour as the majority. And it's just a massive tragedy that in the 20th century, um, at the time of the national liberation movements, um, the communist parties, you know, in the in the global south in places like China and India, um, followed Stalin, and they just completely failed to make these liberatory arguments. And um, I think Franz Fanon um, actually had the best thing that he ever wrote um, was his critique of this process. Um, so I think failing to identify important class differences in each country and overemphasizing the culpability of the West in um, circumstances of oppression renders the post-colonial approach incapable of explaining modern day imperialism and creates victims out of ruling classes in the global South. Now, I wanna turn now um, to addressing the major argument of the Subaltern Studies Collective that Marxism, sorry, not Marxism, the capitalism operates fundamentally differently in the post-colonial world than in Europe, um, thereby rendering Marxism irrelevant. Now, so a, a bit of historical context is necessary too. Like the Subaltern Studies Collective operated in a political environment where Marxism was a serious intellectual current um, on universities. And that helps to explain why, particularly from 1987 onwards, the collective set about quite consciously repudiating Marxism. Like heaps and heaps of articles in their journal were basically like, my Marxism is really wrong and it's always wrong, it was always racist or whatever. Um, but the most influential and probably the most political variant of this argument is uh, Ranajit Guha's conception of dominance without hegemony. That in Europe, the bourgeoisie essentially won the hearts and minds of workers, whereas in the post-colonial world, the ruling class was a creation of colonialism and ruled primarily through repression. Now, central to this conception is that what Guha describes as the subaltern, um, which is a kind of unscientific term, but I think is best understood as meaning peasants and the lumpen proletariat, exist in an entirely autonomous domain. So their, their politics, their culture and ideas are in touched by the bush, untouched by the bourgeoisie. Now, Guha argues that because of these differences, maybe Marxism can explain the West, but it cannot comprehend the East. Now, Guha's arguments are based on a certain, or influenced by a certain postmodern criticism that what they call totalizing theories or grand narratives cannot comprehend difference. Um, <laughs> someone's giggling in my room. Um, but Marxism is not about proving identicality. It asserts that there is a common core of the system everywhere. Now, certainly there are considerable differences um, in the development of capitalism in the East and West, um, among them that post-colonial societies do tend to be more repressive. This is a product of a variety of things. It can be a product of weaker economies, often the absence of entrenched parliamentary democracies, or the fact that states emerging out of recent rebellions also fe often fear recent rebellions. Although I will also add that there is massive sort of difference in the development of capitalism between Western capitalist states as well. Like the development of the United States economy is massively, massively different to the development of the Australian economy. And it's had, you know, sort of correspondingly different um, political outcomes over time. However, the differences just sort of in general terms between East and West, if you can even generalize so much, 
Those differences standing, it is not the case that the post-colonial subaltern has no support whatsoever for the domestic bourgeoisie. The national liberation movements in India, for example, had more popular support than the European bourgeois revolutions ever did. And in India, the figures of the national liberation movement like uh, Nehru and Gandhi and, and others are still venerated across the country. There is today, unfortunately, enormous active, active political support for the far-right Indian People's Party, which is the preferred party of Indian capitalists today, um, and they've got support even among extremely poor sections of society. And similarly, it would be wrong to draw from the existence of difference that Western societies operate entirely through consent. I argued earlier that it's important to see Western societies as class divided, which means that Western capitalism also has states which are designed to um, resorts to violence if necessary to maintain the class-based status quo. So there have been repeated occasions where Western ruling classes have resorted to brutal oppression against their own population, probably most notably in the mass slaughter of workers in World War I and II and the conscription of workers to fight in those wars. The United States uh, famously used intense repression to smash up the Communist Party and then the Black Panthers. And, you know, one of the incidents that um, provoked outrage uh, and exposed the brutality of the state in the 1970s was not just the generally barbaric war in Vietnam, but, but the murder of protesting students in, um, at Kent State University. So I think the recurrent rebellions and the, um, you know, the history of violence in the West just have to prove that Western workers are not entirely or always consenting to their exploitation. But I think that Guho's arguments are actually less about the structures of capitalism in the global south and more about a conception of power that Guho lifts directly from Foucault, which is instead of seeing power as having a material locus in the controllers of industry and state violence, Foucault sees power as dispersed throughout society, manifesting in our interpersonal interactions without a clear source. So this muddy conception of power rejects that there is a unified global system at all, that instead uh, we are all merely individuals bashing into one another. But actually capitalism does exist in every single country. That is not an idea, it's not an opinion of Marxists, it's just a material reality. By giving up on grand narratives, what post-modernists, post-structuralists, post-colonialists and all the rest, what they're actually giving up on is attempting to fight for liberation because it's much, much easier to argue that the focal point of politics should be the individual. And it's easier for individuals to change their dress, their language, their consumer choices, how they live in their relationships. And I'd argue that particularly in the West, this involves almost no struggle um, or repression whatsoever. And for those reasons, partly, it has no chance whatsoever of actually challenging capitalist rule. The main thing post-colonialists end up denying, actually, when focusing on fragments and denying that there is any unified political or economic system, is the revolutionary potential of the international working class. And that is the synthesis of Marxism, proletarian revolution. Marxists maintain that there is in every country a class of exploited people who cooperate in the process of production, who are propelled into struggle irrepressibly because of the deprivation and crises born from the system. And this common interest creates the basis for solidarity across national, cultural, linguistic, religious lines. And this is just a potential for solidarity. It's not automatic, it's not always existing, but socialists want to agitate the consciousness of a material you know, collectivity and a material interest. And we want to try and harness that common interest as a fighting force. And actually the greatest vindication of Marxism in the end is the real class struggle, which there was some discussion in the uh, uh, session on privilege theory just before about how in recent times, Class struggle has been way more vociferous in, you know, in third world and post-colonial societies than it has in the West. Um, so in the last session, Jasmine showed a photo that is quite a bit better than, than this one, um, but <laughs> of uh, strikes by oil workers that have been taking place in Iran for many, many months now. And um, it's just 
yeah, probably the most galvanized and uh, also important working class movement in the world at this moment. And that's just one example. You know, you, we could go back to the Arab Springs, which is the last, you know, true revolutionary wave um, we've seen. Once a year, Indian workers host a gigantic kind of one day general strike, which can involve hundreds of millions of workers at, at some estimates. Um, there are the revolutions in Sudan and Algeria. I could go just on and on about examples of, um, of working class struggle in the third world. But for post-colonialists to prove that Marxism is irrelevant, they would actually have to prove that workers in the global south are not exploited and that workers in the global south do not fight back. And this they can't do. Now, this, the last point about Foucault and power and individualism um, brings us to talking about the impact of post-colonialism on universities today. And so what I'm going to argue now and finish my talk with is very different to what I've argued so far. Um, because I've tried to be generous in this talk a little bit and um, address serious arguments or left arguments that can have a kind of left-wing purchase um, that are associated with post-colonialism. But I think the way post-colonialism actually comes up on university campuses is not so much interesting theoretical debates about the driving forces of imperialism, but as part of the generally censorious and moralistic culture of identity politics which dominates universities today. This is a climate where who is speaking is where, where where who is speaking is more important than what is being said. Um, where using the right language is more important than holding left wing political positions. Um, where there is no truth or material reality, but only endless discourses, experiences, and opinions. And where the task is not to achieve material, collective, structural change, but to decolonize your own mind. It is treated as bigoted to disagree with someone from an oppressed background, regardless of what they are arguing, unless they are arguing Marxist politics, um, and certain concepts like the idea that all Europeans are racist, expressed as white privilege, are treated as gospel and unable to be debated, even from the position of opposing racism and oppression, but having other ideas about how it originates and how it should be challenged. And I think that the, um, the minute focus on language and culture in many ways actually actually trivializes oppression. Like one of my comrades at UQ is doing a course on post-colonialism. And I just think it is absolutely um, staggering that in the year, in the year of Black Lives Matter, um, the assignment in their class on post-colonialism is analyzing um, racism in Disney cartoons. Like, can you think of something that is less relevant to the lives of racially oppressed people in Australia than that right now. In the, in the age of Black Lives Matter, when we're seeing disasters in, you know, Western New South Wales, when there's refugees locked up, like it's just, it's ridiculous that that kind of minutiae is the focus of um, supposedly progressive politics. And I think all of this is actually a barrier to serious research and inquiry. So firstly, I think it's really important to defend a scientific approach to understanding society in the same way that gravity exists regardless of whether someone falling from a building thinks that they can fly, you know, it, capitalism exists even if people think we're actually a million fragments bashing into each other. Um, even if capitalists think they work hard, the economy would not operate without workers. If something is true, it is true regardless of who is saying it, but just as in the natural sciences, the real operations of a thing are not always obvious and our task as the political left should actually be debating to determine how things really work. But in universities, there is a culture of denunciation instead of debate. There is a vicious culture of, of condemning, attempting to ruin the uh, reputations of people who are deemed to have transgressed in their language or some cultural element or to have disagreed with whatever the common sense liberal position on an issue is at the time. And this is not directed towards the right, the state, let alone the ruling class, but almost always towards people who are against oppression, people on the left, those who oppose some form of injustice, but are deemed morally unworthy to argue about it because of their identity, opinions or means. And all of this is part and parcel of post-colonialism and it develops um, because post-colonialism is not about truth, it's not about struggle and it's not about solidarity. It's a framework obsessed with the individual and it's often a vehicle for the personal advancement of individuals through um, enormous bureaucracies like academia. And that was the trajectory of people in the subaltern studies collective, really. People who once talked about Maoism are now just highly paid academics in you know, New York and Chicago and so on. <laughs> 
Now, none of this is good enough for those of us seriously wanting to change the world. Marxists want to defeat imperialism and all forms of oppression, which means defeating capitalism. And for that, we need a lot more than uh, deconstructing and altering the fragments of language and discourse. We need to transform the material world, get rid of the ruling elite that profits from all varieties of destruction and oppression. We need a revolution that destroys the very definite sites of power in capitalism and creates a new democratic society run by the working class. And that is the transformation that we need to open up a world of real human freedom where the majority are able to determine what kind of society they live in and how they live their lives. And so to ever get there, we need to rebuild a left that is intellectually rigorous. Um, I think we should reject the pressures of identity politics that limit who can engage in politics and how closely people can work together and instead fight to widen the parameters of who can speak about and be involved in struggle and argue that people should come as they are in the struggle against capitalism and all forms of oppression. So I hope I've given people some sense of the serious theoretical arguments present in post-colonialism and we should focus on those things and draw them out in the discussion. Um, some of them can be quite left wing. I'm sure some people in the discussion have been influenced by them and that's fine. But to be brutal, in my experience of how these ideas come up on campuses, the main difference between post-colonialism and Marxism is pretty simple. Marxists don't participate in politics to tick boxes of moral worthiness or to play linguistic games. We want to dedicate our resources to most rigorously understanding capitalism in order to figure out how best to destroy it. And we want to encourage the broadest, um, most open, most democratic possible participation in this pursuit.